The views expressed on the Final Straw Radio do not necessarily reflect those of Asheville FM, Friends of Community Radio, or any of the affiliate radio stations airing the show. You're listening to WSFM LP 103.3 in Asheville, North Carolina. This is The Final Straw, and I'm William Goodenough. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions or suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net. Also, if you're interested in rebroadcasting any episode or segment of the show, you're free to do so. Just send us an email if you do. If you'd like to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw, Care of Asheville FM, 864 Haywood Road, Asheville, North Carolina, 28806. The show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned cooperative in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a sample of Firestorm's catalog of books and zines, plus a full calendar of events at their website, firestorm.coop. This week, I had the opportunity to speak with Margaret Killjoy about her new novella, The Lamb Will Slaughter the Lion, which is coming out on August 15th from Tor.com. In this interview, we will talk about how she got into writing genre fiction, how writing has shaped her politics, about the book itself, the importance of fighting battles on a cultural front, among many, many other things. If you're interested, you can come to a book release event that Killjoy will be doing at Firestorm Books and Coffee on August 15th at 7 p.m. You can pre-order a copy of this book from your local bookstore or from RedEmmas.org, an online anarchist source. The track you are hearing right now, recommended by our guest, is by Sycorax off of their 2006 release, Anarcho Witchcraft, entitled Bakunin Illuminati. But first, here are some announcements. On Monday, July 31st, people will gather in Greensboro at 9 a.m. at the Federal Courthouse, 324 West Market Street, in order to support Katie Yao, who is refusing to comply with a federal grand jury convening there to which she's been subpoenaed. And here's an update from Katie on what she's learned about the FGJ. Quote, We have now learned from... We have now learned more from the assistant U.S. attorney about the subject of the federal grand jury to which I have been subpoenaed. This grand jury is looking into what the government has described as a bombing at the GOP headquarters in Hillsboro, North Carolina, this past fall. The AUSA has also indicated that they are interested in, quote, other people, end quote, and, quote, other events. I don't know anything relevant to a criminal investigation of the alleged incident at the GOP headquarters. The broad nature of the government's interest in other information makes clear the way that this and other grand juries are used as fishing expeditions to attempt to coerce testimony on First Amendment protected information. This is one of the many ways grand juries are used to repress social movements and one of many reasons why we resist them. Whatever new information we may learn about this grand jury, I will continue to refuse to cooperate. We didn't have to know what this grand jury was about to know what we are about. Our values are long held. They are nurtured through both triumph and incredible loss, and they cannot be compromised. My resistance to this grand jury is the easiest decision I have ever made, even if the consequences may be difficult. I will continue to refuse to comply with this subpoena, and I have every faith in my community's ability to support me in doing so. End quote. If you're feeling it, show up in Greensboro on Monday to show support. More information and a full statement can be found at ncresiststhegrandjury.com. If you are in Asheville on Wednesday, you are invited to attend a workshop at Firestorm Books and Coffee, 610 Haywood Road, at 7 p.m. entitled, What is a Grand Jury? The discussion will be presented by the Scuffletown Anti-Repression Committee. Keep your eyes on your favorite anarchist news source for updates on resisting Amren in Tennessee, which is going on today and tomorrow. For context, you can hear an interview that Bursts did about this resistance by searching Amren on our blog. 
Also, keep your eyes peeled for information on resisting the far right in Charlottesville on August 12th by following the hashtag NoNewKKK. Before we begin the interview, here are some words from anarchist prisoner Sean. What you say, what you say, what you say, This week we're going to switch gears. I know all of you machete-wielding savage cannibals take time out from pouring gas and vodka bottles, so you can tune in and laugh so hard you might just pee a little bit. But today, we got to get all scientific. We're going to talk about rats. Rats of the four-legged variety, and mice. A guy named John B. Calhoun was a shrink at the National Institute of Mental Health. Beginning in the 1940s, Calhoun built what he intended to be utopian environments for rats or mice. He built his first rat city in 1947. But our focus is going to be on the experiments he conducted in the early 1970s with what he termed Universe 25. With Universe 25, Calhoun set out to construct what would be an absolute utopia for mice. The tank was 8 feet 5 inches square with 4.5 foot tall walls. Each wall had 16 vertical mesh tunnels with four horizontal corridors leading from each, and those each connected to four nesting boxes. That adds up to 256 nesting boxes, housing up to 15 mice each, for a max capacity, if my math is right, of 3,840 mice. Universe 25 was a veritable mouse resort, a gated community of wealthy and privileged mice elites. It was kept at an optimal 68 degrees Fahrenheit and contained an abundance of food and water and nesting material. The universe was cleaned every month or two, and the mouse residents had no predators to worry about. A life of luxury, right? The perfect utopia. On day one, the first four breeding pairs of mice were introduced to Universe 25. On day 104, they were settled in and began breeding. The population doubled roughly every 55 days. After 315 days, population growth slowed. The population was just over 600, just a fraction of the max capacity. And it wasn't that the mice were physically unable to reproduce. They were socially incapable. Check this out. In the midst of this seemingly perfect utopia, the mice stressed out, went bonkers, and then sputtered out. Consider, a bunch of male... A bunch of male malcontents congregated in a large group right in the middle of the commons of Universe 25, laying around lethargic and inactive, except for occasional outbreaks of random purposeless violence. Abandoned in their nests, nursing mothers stressed out and attacked their own offspring. Infant abandonment and mortality skyrocketed. Lone females retreated to nesting boxes on upper levels, secluding themselves. Another group of males that never engaged in procreation or fighting lived in self-involved, meaningless lives, eating, sleeping, and grooming themselves. Cannibalism, deviation from standard sexual patterns, and senseless violence characterized life in Universe 25. On day 560, the population peaked at 2,200, roughly 1,600 mice less than the max capacity. After day 600, no pregnancies, no surviving young. The mice in Universe 25 were on a path to extinction. Even when the population dwindled back to the numbers from the good old days, the mice never regained the social ability to regenerate. So, why would mice in a mouse utopia, needing for nothing, stress out, go nuts, and destroy themselves? Calhoun concluded that things went south as soon as the number of mice exceeded the number of meaningful social roles. That is, When a growing number of mice had no purpose, no reason to live, all normal social interaction ceased. Mice lost the ability to form meaningful bonds, and the community totally unraveled. There was no point to their lives. They stopped giving a damn. Now, this is really important. Consider Thomas Malthus, an ecologist of his school of thought, long theorized that overpopulation will deplete food and natural resources leading to famine and resource wars. You know, Paul Ehrlich's The Population Bomb. But what Calhoun proved time and again is that overpopulation in terms of exceeding available geographic space or depleting resources isn't the real problem. 
For his rat and mouse populations, geographic space was irrelevant, as was resource availability. A population will generally never get to that crisis. The real crisis is when you overpopulate by exceeding the meaningful social roles, and you end up with a population that is socially disoriented and distorted. That's what causes even a utopia to become dystopic, leading to complete social disintegration and then extinction. Also consider, this isn't a single experiment. In 1947, Calhoun's first rat city had a max capacity of 5,000, but the population peaked at just 200 because of the absence of meaningful social roles, and then sputtered out. In 1954, a utopia with the max capacity of 48 peaked at 80, and then devolved into catastrophe and extinction. Clearly from these examples, overpopulation is not defined by the population size in relation to max capacity. So, assuming these findings involving rats and mice apply universally to humans as well, there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is that we will not destroy all life on the planet with our population expansion. The bad news is, we are, as a species, going to destroy ourselves before we ever get there. We are currently somewhere on a spectrum of hypersexuality and violence, followed by asexuality and self-destruction. Our complete absence of meaningful social roles dooms us to internet porn, mothers killing their own babies, spasms of pointless violence, and then apathy, listlessly sputtering out as a species. Calhoun's Universe 25 gives us an interesting context in which to consider our situation. If we don't reduce our bloated population quickly, we will literally be bored to death. Turns out, despite all our rage, we are all just rats in a cage. This is Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain from Universe 26 in Lebanon, Ohio. If you're listening, you are the resistance. You can write to Sean Swain at Sean Swain 243-205, Warren CI, P.O. Box 120, 5787 State Route 63, Lebanon, Ohio, 45036. Updates on his situation and more writings by Sean can be found at seanswain.org. Uh, so, hello, I am here with Margaret Kiljoy. Uh, speaking about her new novella, The Lamb Will Slaughter the Lion, which is due to come out next month sometime. Um, would you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about what you do and how you got into kind of writing fiction? Uh, yeah, I'm Margaret Kiljoy. Um, I I write fiction. Um, I write nonfiction, too, especially essay-length uh, nonfiction. But um, I primarily... My, my passion and uh, to a greater and greater extent my, my job is writing fiction. Most of the money I make writing fiction is actually uh, ghost writing trashy heterosexual romance novels. Oh, wow. Um, but, but this is um, my first attempt at a – or this is my first mainstream published uh, novella. Um, so this is sort of basically me breaking into a, a more mainstream uh, writing career. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got into writing fiction. Um, my dad ran a zine in the '80s, um, and he mailed it out to you know a couple hundred subscribers, and uh, included um, fiction from his kids as well as his own and things like that. So there's definitely <laughs> horrible stories I wrote when I was like six in there, <laughs> and I kind of just stayed writing fiction uh, for a long time. And got into it as an adult, mostly through zine culture and writing my own zines. And uh, so I wrote a lot of uh, novellas, actually, and short fiction and published them as zines. And then in the past maybe four years, I've been uh, transitioning to mainstream publishing in the science fiction world. Cool. I want to mention that you are the first person that we've brought onto the final straw to talk about a work of fiction. And it's super exciting for me to like have you on as an author and also to like to sort of bring a more, you know, um, creative sort of strain into the final straw. So thanks a lot for coming onto the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Of course. We're here to talk about your new novella, uh, The Lamb Will Slaughter the Lion. What is the release date for that? 
Uh, August 15th. August 15th. Excellent. Um, Will you talk about what led you into writing this book and what kind of book you were setting out to write initially? Sure. I first wrote a draft of uh, a novella called Freedom, Iowa in 2013. It was sort of the afterbirth of a much longer novella I wrote called A Country of Ghosts that came out from Combustion Books in 2014. And A Country of Ghosts is very consciously an anarchist utopian uh, novella and set in an alternate 19th century world. And at the time I was writing this, I was, you know, living in a van and couch surfing and traveling and as I had been for um, my entire adult life at that point. And I found out that this is actually a fairly common thing, that sometimes when people finish longer works, they just keep going. And so I finished A Country of Ghosts, the first draft of it, but I was on a roll. I was writing thousands of words a day. I wanted to keep going. And what I wanted to do was I wanted to write about home. I wanted to write about a traveler who finds home. And so I wrote Freedom, Iowa, about a squatted town in Iowa called Freedom. The squatters have named it that. Mm -hmm. And it was definitely just kind of wish fulfillment fantasy, and it actually wasn't genre fiction. It was uh, kind of a a detective story. I was like, oh, what would it be like to write an anarchist detective story? But it wasn't very good, and I was really writing it for myself, and it showed Mm -hmm. uh, throughout the the manuscript that I had written it for myself. So I didn't do anything with it for about two years. And then a year ago, um, I decided to turn it into genre fiction and add demons. And, uh, and I did it because cynically I did it so that I could like potentially sell it. Right. Mm -hmm. Because it's much easier to sell um, genre fiction than literary fiction, at least my background is in genre fiction, so those are the connections and the, the publishing that I tend to do. But I I realized that it also made it just substantially a better book when I wrote it for other people instead of for myself. And I think that there's this misconception that popular fiction is somehow worse, um, mm. whereas I actually tend to think it's the opposite. I mm. think it takes a lot of craft um, that I'm still learning to write good, accessible fiction. And so learning to write for other people was the major revision. And I actually completely rewrote the book. The, almost nothing has, almost nothing remains the same. Mm. Very few like individual sentences are left over from that first draft. And this is uh, book one of a series, is that right? Yeah, uh, it's book one of the the Danielle Kane series, mm-hmm. um, and we'll see how long it is. I, I signed a contract with Tor dot com for two books, and so I've already actually written the sequel. The Barrow will send what it may, mm-hmm. which will be out sometime, I think, spring next year, and it'll depend on how well the book does um, to yeah. find out whether it'll be extended. Uh, you already said a bunch about the book and sort of like why you wrote it. Um, Would you sort of describe the book for listeners in your own words without giving away any spoilers or anything? (laughs) Yeah, sure. In in my own words, it's funny because I've seen a lot of, this is the first time someone else has written the copy for my books, the the advertising copy, the, you know, the back cover and the, the thing that appears on Amazon and such. And so I was like, what, I don't get to call it a a dropkick in the mouth punk fantasy, (laughs) Um, which I admit I I would probably never call it, but it, it's not inaccurate. I, I, I think that that's fine. Uh, when I first sent it, the editor, uh, who I think is amazing, um, Diana Foe, she was calling it Buffy without the humdrum of suburbia. Wow. And, uh, cause it's anarchist demon hunters, but I think if I if I were to put it in my own words, I would say it's a this first book is a it's a parable about the lure of authority set against a squatted town in Iowa. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Um, Buffy without the what? The humdrum of suburbia. <laughs> That's incredible, but with like the humdrum of anarchy. Yeah. That... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To me, is somewhat humdrum, but I think to many of the readers would yeah. not be. 
Definitely. And that's like something I definitely want to touch on like later in the interview. But without as well, like giving too many things away about the book, one of the, the many things that struck me about, to be clear, I read this, read it in about an hour and a half. Um, I found it to be an extremely refreshing um, piece of fiction. But one of the many things that like struck me about the novel was how rooted in subculture it was or is. And I really loved that. I could, I think I told you after I read it that I could see so many of my friends and comrades in the characters of this book and how they spoke and so on. But I was wondering if you would talk about the role of subculture and how you decided to depict it in the way you did. Um, it also might be interesting to hear any thoughts on like the book's intended audience or so forth. Sure. Um, I want to clarify it's a novella, novella. And, and not a novel, which is Sorry. why you can read it an hour and a half. I, I believe you that you're a fast reader. So it's a, it's a very short book, but it, um, I think we have to represent ourselves because other people don't do a very good job of representing us. Um, I also think that it's useful to be represented. I do believe that not just our political lives, but even our subcultural lives are are actually very interesting and have a lot to say to a wider audience. But that when people come into our communities for the purpose of representing us, uh, I found that even the best intentioned don't do it right most of the time. I help with a few other people run a, a review website called Anarcho Geek Review. And some of the books that I've reviewed on there are about how anarchists are represented in fiction. And I find there are sort of cliches and stereotypes about us that are like somewhat true, but there's somehow there's a different way that someone who comes from within that might represent or address those cliches. Mm -hmm. Um, that I believe is is probably more honest. Of course, I also do believe that, um, and it, this gets into sort of murky territory. As a as a fiction writer, you have to be able to write the other. It's a conversation that happens a lot in the science fiction world right now. Is how do you write the other? Um, there's a, a book called Writing the Other mm. that's actually very good, and I think that science fiction um, leftist, anarchist, progressive science fiction is like far ahead of most of the rest of culture about how to represent the other. But I still believe that it is useful to have our own voice uh, appear to people. And it, it definitely is written for a mainstream audience, although I write in this way where I try to write things simply, but not, not necessarily from the outside looking in. I don't necessarily like hold someone's hand and be like, and this is what it means to be punk, or this is why he has studs on his vest or, you know, whatever the subcultural reference is. So it was an interesting challenge to write accessibly, but in a way that would also seem and feel authentic to me and uh, to other people who have similar experiences to me. Mm -hmm. And I actually think that writing for a mainstream audience is, in addition to being a challenge, it's, it's something that I actually, I hope more uh, anarchists do in the near future, not just necessarily with fiction. Um, but I, I'm very excited about propaganda that faces outwards. And I don't necessarily actually see this book as um, propaganda for anarchism. In some ways, the the parable that's at the center of it is could be construed as a, a critique of mm. statelessness. But I think that the mainstream is actually ready for anarchist ideas in a way that, at least in my experience, I've been involved since the early aughts. I've never seen the mainstream so ready for anarchist ideas. And a lot of anarchist ideas have already filtered out to the mainstream. And I think that that's a, a very positive thing. And so I'm excited to try and be part of that process. Mm -hmm. And also it's it's... The intended audience is, of course, like maybe at its most focused is, a, you know, people who traveled for way too long and are looking for a home. So in some ways, the intended audience is always going to be me. It's interesting to hear folks' thoughts on representation and, you know, depiction. I always I always thought about uh, Ursula K. Le Guin's The Dispossessed, that novel, as being also like a very anarchist novel, but also 
it has in it a very like pointed critique of statelessness. And it, it, I almost think that it's like an anarchism 101 plus 201 rolled into the same novel. Um, and I'd be really interested to hear about your thoughts on like a critique of statelessness and, you know, people being people. But I, I also was wondering what you thought about that movie, The East. Like when you were <laughs> when you were talking, I was I, I, I was I kept thinking about The East. And for those listeners who don't know, The East was, I don't even know, maybe made like seven or eight years ago, loosely based on the real life story of the entrapment of Eric McDavid by the FBI. And it follows very closely, like certain aspects of punk anarchist subculture. And I was wondering, like, what you thought of that and if you think that these two things like exist in the same sphere if that makes any sense sure i'm going to i'm going to answer the f- the first question first yeah. about um the critique of statelessness that is uh contained within this novella and the dispossessed and actually i think um all of the best works of anarchist fiction i edited a book a long time ago called mythmakers and lawbreakers anarchist writers on fiction And I interviewed anarchist fiction writers about what it means to be an anarchist in writing fiction. And one of the things that came up, um, I believe it was Starhawk who brought this up, is that fiction is better at asking questions than providing answers. And I actually think that that's very anarchistic. I think that that's a a very useful method by which to uh, expose people to things because it allows people to come to their own conclusions, even if they're conclusions that might not be exactly what I hope that they will come to. Mm-hmm. So I think it's, it's, it's brilliant that The Dispossessed paints a complicated picture of an anarchist society and actually presents a rebel within the anarchist society and then exposes him to a capitalist society. And he's like, well, I guess actually the anarchism isn't so bad after all. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm i sort of terrified to compare my writing to Ursula Le Guin, although I think that politically she's um, probably my single biggest inspiration in terms of how she integrates politics into her writing. Uh, I think other political writers do an amazing job of it. Cory Doctorow in particular is doing an amazing job of it right now. But I'm more interested in Le Guin's approach. So yeah, that was a, a conscious thing that I, I I knew I was going to be writing something that would be not critical of statelessness, or not anti-statelessness, but talk about some of the actual complicated conflicts that would come up and and have come up within um, anti-authoritarian contexts that I've experienced. As for the movie The East, (laughs) you know, it's funny because I actually think The East came closest to getting it right. And in some ways that makes it all the more dangerous, right? Because it there are moments in that movie that feel absolutely real. There are moments in it that I'm like, I have been there. I've never played uh, verbal consent spin the bottle. But that moment in the, in the film captures the love that comrades have for one another inside an intense level of conflict and kind of an echo chamber that, um, that clandestinity offers for better and worse. And I think it it does a really amazing job of capturing certain elements of who we are culturally. I think that it paints a dangerous picture of who we are politically. Mm-hmm. Although I don't think it's so off base. And in some ways, I actually think the ways in which we are represented by well-meaning outsiders actually is some of the most useful critique we could have for our own communities is we can say, this is how we're coming across. And maybe this isn't how I think we should come across. What are we doing slightly wrong? But I I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, on some level, I know how I feel about the East, and I've written a review of it uh, for a Narco Geek review, but it's it stays in my head. I, I think about the East in the way that I think about some of my favorite films that have nothing to do with anarchism Mm. because they capture something emotionally true to me. Even if the East gets so many things so complicatedly wrong. I personally had a very 
reactionary and bad reactionary sort of like <laughs> number of years after I watched the East because I had like I had it in my head that that kind of representation would maybe necessarily lead to some kind of assimilation or co-optation within like a wider society which like I'm not entirely sure if that is pure cynicism or if that is sort of an accurate read on how representation within capitalism sort of goes along one of those trajectories but yeah I wonder if you like had any thoughts about what you think about you know assimilation and and whatever should we just like fuck it and say like whatever it's going to happen or what do you think? Yeah, that's one of the more complicated things about something like the East is that you're like, well, when people represent us wrong, what happens to the people who get involved mm-hmm. because they saw that? And they could have some very dangerous political ideas uh, as a result of that. And that that's true. And that is a, a real danger. And part of me does kind of want to say like, well, I... I don't know and sort of throw my hands in the air and be like, well, people are going to misrepresent us and we should be critical of when people misrepresent us and say, here are the ways in which you've misrepresented us. Um, And I fully support anyone who's like, actually just like, fuck that movie, Mm -hmm. you know? And so I think I was only responding from where I'm at personally as a viewer removed from sort of the larger context and the effect it'll have on the world, which is actually kind of ironic because I spend a lot of my time thinking about the impact of culture on the broader world. No, that's super right on. To maybe get back to the book, so their magic um, and so you mentioned demons and summoning and so on, but magic, the role of magic in this book is really captivating to me. And I get the sense that magic exists in Freedom, Iowa, but doesn't really exist anywhere else. Could you talk about the role of magic or magical spiritualism in the book and what, if anything, you were aiming to describe by depicting it in that way? Yeah, it's it's interesting because I, I write about magic a fair amount, um, both in a traditional fantasy setting and a... I guess you would technically call it urban fantasy setting, although there's nothing urban about this book in a contemporary fantasy setting. I'm not like a a true believer in magic the way that a lot of people that I have a lot of respect for are. Um, I have very complicated feelings about magic in terms of the real world. Mm-hmm. But I think that the effect that magic can have on us in the real world is actually very comparable to the reason that I use magic so much in fiction, which is that it it makes for a great metaphor. Um, I'm able to personify specific ideas, whether they're political ideas, cultural ideas, whatever type of idea. I'm able to personify those, in this case, into the form of a a demon, a a three-antlered deer. That's not really spoiling anything. That's on the cover of the book. And I think a metaphor allows for us to kind of interact with plots that are easier to digest and then still get across complicated ideas. Um, so you can still have something that's like slightly more action driven instead of just people sitting around and talking about abstract philosophical concepts, uh, which I actually, again, getting into that sort of like pop culture writing is actually sometimes some of the best writing. And, but I, I do like this idea. So uh, there actually is magic elsewhere in this world, but it is just very rare. Um, the the sequel gets into you know some more about the way that magic works in this world, and it's it's very rare, and so most people don't believe in it, and it doesn't interact with most people's lives. But the one of the sort of metaphors that I like in that is that there's a this idea that there's a world underneath of our world that you fall into sort of through the looking glass kind of experience. And that is actually, and this wasn't even conscious, but I think about a lot of the themes that are involved in a book, often you think about after you've written them. Mm -hmm. My own experience of dropout culture, dropout anarchism, I dropped out of college in 2002 to hop freight trains and try and overthrow the government. I wasn't very good at either of those things. (laughs) And um, so... 
but I found this world underneath of our world. And even discovering anarchism was that, you know, um, there's so much history we've been involved. There's been millions of us affecting change all over the world. And yet I never heard about it once the entire time until I was 19 years old. So discovering that world underneath of the world was amazing and it was, it was magical. And so our protagonist is cynical and has been a traveling anarchist for a long time. And yet she's able to discover a world under the world and therefore sort of fall in love with the world again. We talked a little bit about before we started recording about like self portrayal in terms of the, uh, in terms of the protagonist. I was wondering if you wanted to talk a little bit about that and, and like talk a little bit about how much of yourself is in her and like the sort of evolution that that protagonist has had for within the course of you writing this particular book. And if you don't, that's totally okay too. Yeah. Um, uh, William is referencing how in, right before we rec started recording this interview, I explained that um, the protagonist was actually written uh, in the very first draft when it was a very different book was a, a cis man. And, uh, when I wrote the first draft of this book, I identified as um, genderqueer, assigned male at birth, but had been spent much of my life identifying well as a cis man without knowing the word cis. And since then, um, I've come out as a as a trans woman, uh, both to myself and the world. And I actually changed. I gender swapped um, Danielle before any of that happened. Uh, before. I came out or anything like that because the the story demanded it and also she kind of sometimes you write characters and sometimes characters write themselves and sort of an obnoxious cliche um, and actually it doesn't happen nearly as much now that I'm a more experienced writer but basically her character told me who she was and that was actually very useful. There's a thing that I've I've had a, co a conversation uh, with a, a transmasculine genre fiction writer about, where I was invited to participate in, a, you know, to contribute to an anthology um, that included genre fiction that included trans characters, especially protagonists. And for that given year, I realized I didn't have a single story or book out with a non cis a stated non-cis uh, protagonist. And what I realized was that I self-insert cis women most of the time. Mm -hmm. If I have a more self-insert character, and Danielle Kane is more self-insert than most of my characters. Mm -hmm. And this guy I was talking to basically says he does the exact same thing. You know, he, he puts uh, cis men or just... You can also do this like sort of awful thing when you write where you just don't necessarily describe the, um, uh, I don't know what the name of the axis between cis and trans is, but mm -hmm. you don't necessarily describe where they sit on that axis. Um, you simply just use the pronouns that you use and describe the way the world interacts with them, mm -hmm. which does get into a, a danger of representation. There's this idea in our day-to-day -day lives, if you're constantly referring to whether or not someone is cis or trans, or constantly referring, you know, if like you're talking about a woman and you like, for some reason, like need to be like this trans woman, every single time you describe her as a woman, that's a little bit awkward. And yet within fiction writing, it actually uh, becomes essentially necessary to mark characters that are other. And ideally, you would do it in a way where you also mark the characters who are not other to try and diminish the importance of it being other. But if, if a white author writes a book in which none of the characters are described racially, mm -hmm. most readers, especially white readers, will read all of the characters as white. Mm -hmm. And on some level, they therefore are white. And this is the sort of Dumbledore question. What, is, what does that mean? Okay, so J.K. Rowling outed a Dumbledore from Harry Potter after all of the books were published. Oh, I remember that. He's, he's like gay, right? Yeah, he's okay. gay. And it's complicated because in some ways that's that's great, right? It's mm -hmm. it's really great that Dumbledore was finally able to come out. 
But by not in any way describing Dumbledore as gay throughout the books, it's not gay representation in fiction. Mm -hmm. If you're J.K. Rowling and Harry Potter is such an important part of our like cultural landscape, it actually does still help because outing because people are still thinking and talking about Dumbledore, mm-hmm. and probably will be for the next hundred years. So, it still is somewhat useful. But so it's actually important when writing, and very complicated when writing. And I have a lot of complicated feelings about it myself. You know, I'm white, and so I need to be very aware that I don't necessarily know what it's like to read a book as a person of color and see what the representation feels like. And so I interact with that with a lot of conversations. I'm also not transmasculine, and one of the characters in this book is marked as transmasculine. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, on some small level, I can draw from my own trans experience, but it's a very different trans experience, and I don't mean to. And um, it's also a, a trans man of color. And so I need to... I need to communicate with other people in order to successfully write that character. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm not above reproach of, you know, maybe there are many ways in which some of the characters who are rep- represented within my books are not well represented. And that's just a, mm-hmm. a continuing process. I really appreciated how that character was represented. Um, not to like give too much away, but like the first time you see him, he is like described as a man his race is marked and he's also marked as like wearing a dress and like being really handsome. Um, and I really, I really appreciated that as well. Maybe this will dovetail really nicely on what we were talking about, but I was really interested in, um, this aspect of the book, which, which seems like somewhat unremarkable to ask this question given like our own intersectionalities as human beings. But, the out out of all the characters, the baseline sexuality seems to be queer, and I think I only located one straight dynamic in the entire piece. Uh, would you talk about this some? Yeah, I mean, in some ways, it's just representing myself and the people around me that mm-hmm. many of the relationships that I, I witness like aren't even capable of being heterosexual. Like, I mean, I. You know, speaking as a trans woman, I'm not quite certain how I would indicate any relationship that I'm in as as heterosexual. Mm-hmm. And there probably are other people with different experience of transness where you could identify oneself as being in a straight relationship, um, regardless of one's trans status. But I also, I like normalizing things. I like it not being a big deal in as much as I was just talking about the need to like mark people as other or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um when we're writing fiction, I also try to like not make a big deal out of it. And sometimes books and stories need that. Sometimes if the queerness is in opposition to society's norms, it, you kind of need to address that complicatedness. But I'm writing an anarchist utopian town. And so queerness is like not even a, not even a question of whether or not it would be acceptable. Mm-hmm. And so um, just having the characters, yeah, be in these in these uh, setups. Um, I believe there's like, yeah, like a man and man relationship, a woman and woman um, crush, mm-hmm. and um, a uh, heterosexual relationship as the three relationship dynamics within the book. Mm-hmm. And anarchism has so often historically been, you know, a haven for marginalized identities and peoples and stuff. So I, I, I found, I found that as like a queer person myself to be an accurate depiction of, of that. But I'm interested sort of to hear readers reactions to that, especially if they don't have not existed within like queer punk anarchist subculture in any way, like what they think of, what that's what what's going on do you anticipate any kind of reaction to that or have you gotten any kind of reaction to that i do think there is more reaction to the sexuality of my characters than i like would have expected in general um the protagonist of a country of ghosts my my utopian novella from 2014 is gay Mm -hmm. and is a you know a, a gay cis man and is in a gay relationship and one of my first readers uh who's 
slightly more like normal world than I am, Mm -hmm. wrote me to be a little bit upset and was like, well, I didn't know that he was gay. So in the second chapter, when he was talking about flirting with men, it threw me through a loop. And I was like, wait, is the protagonist a woman? And I I completely Mm -hmm. had them in my head wrong the whole time. And um, whereas I had actually only included that piece uh, just to sort of mark the character as gay at some point so that, you know, people aren't like too shocked when he falls for a man. And I, it hadn't occurred to me that it would be a big deal. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of a naivety that comes from living within this bubble. And the other thing is that I found that people, um, so a, uh, a queer anarchist collective in Montreal is currently filming a, a book called Huron, a, a, a movie called Huron, A Country of Ghosts, which is based on um, my book, A Country of Ghosts. And a lot of their, um, the sort of central tagline of it is that it is a, um, a queer science fiction mm-hmm. movie. And it was interesting to think about. And they're actually doing a lot of really interesting things to queer the process um, mm-hmm. in terms of, uh, for example, they cast all the characters genderless they did not i mean the the characters have genders but those characters were not described in the script those genders came into being through who was cast mm. and they've been doing a lot of work to say what does it mean to to queer filmmaking but it was interesting to me because it it never occurred to me in any of my um you know i, I don't describe that i describe that book as my anarchist utopian book i don't describe that as uh, a work of queer fiction, which it is. It is a work of queer fiction. I think I prioritize sexuality and gender differently than other people around me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I uh, remember having a conversation with a mutual, I think a mutual friend of ours one time about, um, who is also a trans person who write, who writes both fiction and nonfiction. And he was saying that one of his stated goals for, you know, the next 15 years was to see a shift in trans and queer representation where transness and queerness are not central to the person's identity. Like, you don't have to spend half the book being like, and woe is me, I'm a trans person, or like, here's how it's terrible to be queer, here are all my things, you know. And of course, there's, you know, struggles that come along with those two identities and modes of personhood but yeah I mean I think that I think very much that I've been seeing more and more along those lines and uh, um, the lamb will slaughter the lion is is really like going along that traje- trajectory in my opinion so this is just occurring to me right now where the biblical the lamb will slaughter the lion has kind of a biblical ring to it it was that intentional oh I don't know the actual quote <laughs> off the top of my head. Um, what, you don't know your Bible? I think it's the, the lion will lay down with the lambs, yeah. or the lamb will lay, lay down with the lions, or something like mm-hmm. that. Yeah, it, it's intentionally a, a reference to something I'm clearly not entirely versed in. <laughs> um, and yeah, this idea that um, instead of peace as okay now we're all going to get along fine mm-hmm. like and let's all forget the fact that you have been hunting and eating me you know my entire species existence um instead it's this um uh, i don't want to use the word vengeance but maybe retribution but maybe those are synonyms um this like correction of the problem that is uh more um more violent although that you know that is the one of the central questions of the book is is not to and does not present an answer to that. Um, I clearly, even though this this demon is becomes that who is the lamb who will slaughter the lion named Ulixi, even though they're clearly um, an antagonistic force within the the book, I like them enough that I got Ulixi the deer tattooed on my hand. So, Excellent. so you you've spoken a lot about you've used the word utopian a lot in this in this interview and and so have i i was wondering about to what extent is this novella a utopian work so i i care a lot about utopia um and i think that it's a a somewhat forgotten aspect of the anarchist project you know i at the 
risk of talking about something sort of bullshit and heady, like the the debate between uh, Chomsky and Foucault. Mm-hmm. As I understand it, Chomsky is like, no, we need these like blueprints of what society could look like. And then Foucault just kind of sits around and smokes and looks really cool and is like, no, no, we don't. Those are bad. And Foucault wins that debate. He wins that debate because he's so goddamn sexy. And it makes his ideas so goddamn sexy. And Chomsky just kind of looks like a chump. <laughs> but I but I don't actually disagree with Chomsky in that. Like, I, I think if I were um, to pick a side on that, I would actually pick... As an anarchist, I'm always going to approach any blueprint as a suggestion um, because they're, they're not laws. They're not things I am beholden to. But it is only by envisioning something that we're able to move in that general direction um, by envisioning what might be beyond the horizon it in- incites us to move to that horizon and see what is there or what we can make there and I think that that's one of the the goals of fiction all fiction is to expand our imaginations to ask questions instead of provide answers and so I actually think utopian fiction is a really good way to express utopian ideas because it is less likely to be considered a blueprint than if I wrote my nonfiction book, How Society Should Be Run by Margaret Kiljoy, mm-hmm. which um, I don't know, maybe one day I'll write a terrible book and call it that. But I, I think that fiction is a, a very useful way to do that because uh, it calls its own objectivity into question. And I think there are ways to like double down on that. The Dispossessed is a really good example of that. Um, you know, in that it doubles down on being like, this is not a blueprint because here I'm showing you rebels within this society. And I believe very strongly that anarchism is a positive project as well as a negative project. And I think that this is a a false dichotomy that um, plays to our enemy's strengths to get too focused on about whether or not anarchy is a positive project or a negative project. Because uh, in my mind, the destruction of an oppressive existent and the creation of potential alternatives um, are so intertwined that I can't imagine one without the other. And so I think that a balancing act in terms of the ideas includes a lot more utopian ideas right now because I think the the negative project ideas of anarchism, and by that I don't mean like negative qualities like bad things, I mean like the things that are exist to like negate the existent to use jargon. I think that those ideas, the negative ideas have more foothold both in terms of uh, mainstream understanding of our, our project and also um, within anarchism right now. And so I think that providing positive ideas is also useful, but I, I don't totally see The Lamb That Will Slaughter the Lion as a, as a utopian book. I, I will probably call it utopian in some ways every now and then because it's, if anything, it's about the fleeting interactions that we have with utopia rather than creating a stable alternative and showing the ways in which um, any attempt at any kind of stable alternative will continue to be in conflict with the existent, uh, which is kind of very vague, but that's sort of the safest I can go without spoiling the end of the book. Definitely. Well, as, as you were talking, it, I, the, the term realistic utopia came to my mind. I, I'm not sure like what, if that's something that just like popped in my head or something that I read somewhere. I think about that in terms of that book, A Woman on the Edge of Time by Marge Piercy, which is a very stark black and white contrasting of a utopian as fuck world that includes like pretty much everything you'd want and everybody's kind of chill with it with this like kind of hellish modern day 1970s sort of nightmare world which for me like that book is extremely cathartic to read but is definitely seemingly like somewhat unattainable especially maybe especially right now or whatever that is supposed to mean but reading this one it seems like that world is like somewhat more attainable and there's you know structures in it that we see every day there's practices that we use all the time and not just like us and punk anarchism but as you know people 
with outside of that subculture use it all the time. So I really appreciated that. You have spoken around this question a lot in this uh, interview, but I am interested in sort of the intersection of anarchism and art, you know, fiction, music, visual arts, all of that stuff. And I was wondering if you had any opinions on this intersection. Um, and I'd be really interested to hear how, like, how writing has informed your own anarchism. Yeah, those are two really interesting questions. I think a lot about anarchist culture and anarchist impacts on culture. And I talk with a lot of really smart people about what these impacts are and how we can help shape society. And one of the conclusions that I've been sitting with is that my current framework of how things change is that the cultural front, um, to actually use a phrase that our enemy uses, I'm under the impression that there's this sort of like mm. cultural war is this like a thing that fascists are consciously engaged in against us and against everyone. But there's a, a cultural front in any kind of conflict and it's the long, slow game. Mm -hmm. But I actually think it's one of the main ways that we change things fundamentally. And I personally think that the, the crisis that we're in right now where sort of neoliberalism has come to a shuddering halt at the hands of the resurgence of nationalism and fascism, I think the, the rise of, um, of fascism can in part be seen as a reaction to us winning a cultural war. And uh, when I say us, I sort of mean progressives, but I actually mean anarchists because, you know, I mean, I think to myself, the, the first time I at least personally ran across consent, uh, sexual consent, was within anarchist spaces. And even then, this was maybe 2003 or four, within the forest defense communities of the Pacific Northwest, it was like weird. Everyone was like, you do What? You ask before you kiss somebody? <laughs> How is that not just the most awkward thing in the world? Well, let's give it a shot, but I'm not holding my breath for this to work. And 15 years later, it's a mainstream concept. And that's amazing. And now, granted, when things become mainstream concepts, they get like awful things like codified into law and people start reacting to them badly, not just bad people reacting to them badly, but like, you know, it people create echo chamber effects and purity problems and all of these sorts of things, right? But that's a risk that we're always going to need to take. Anything we create can be recuperated and used against us, but the same as I wouldn't go into war and be like, well, I can't use this automatic weapon I invented because if they kill me, they'll take it and use it against my friends. You still have to use the weapons you've developed and we still need to use these cultural concepts that we develop, even if they might be used against us one day. And so, and I think just overall, um, culturally, we've been gaining a lot of ground, uh, trans acceptance being another very clear one. Um, I, I don't know that I would have had the courage to come out even to myself. Actually, no, I do know. I didn't have the courage to come out to myself 15 years ago. I, I knew 15 years ago but I, I consciously shoved those thoughts down because I did not want to be a trans woman um, because what that was in culture was so monstrous. And I didn't want that. Yet enough people have paved the way that now... So I, okay, so I think we're winning the cultural war. Many aspects of what we're up to have been winning the cultural war. Anti-authoritarianism, um, decentralization, you know, so not political concepts as well as identity concepts, I believe, have been filtering out. We haven't taken political power. And I think overall that is actually to our, our positive mm. because I, most of the ways that one could take political power are certainly very unanarchistic. But the right wing does have political power. And so they were like, OK, we're losing culturally. So we need to act right now hard on a, a political level. And so this is a, a last desperate attack but that makes it sound like I think they're going to lose. I don't have any strong conception of whether or not they're going to win or lose. Mm. Um, but I, I believe that it is the last gasp against 
um, the forces of feminism and trans acceptance and um, anti-nationalism and all of these other things. I am proud to help join in that cultural fight. Um, I am proud to help espouse cultural ideas that help people come up with what is possible. Yeah, and I also do it partly because, like, as I get older, some of the more direct political stuff is uh, is harder for me. I have, um, you know, a fair amount of trauma and PTSD and anxiety and things that make engaging in, say, street-level conflict um, not impossible, mm-hmm. um, but higher stakes. They're, they're harder for me than they were when I was younger. And so this is, in some ways, I do this because in some ways it's safer. Um, I will probably always care about both, and I, I hope that I will always, in some level, engage in both. In terms of your second question, uh, how has writing shaped my anarchism? Um, it was actually interesting. I, you know, you, um, I'd never really thought about that mm. too much, um, which is sort of terrible. I, you know, think about oh, what are the effects that me and my peers can have on the world, but I, I didn't think too consciously about what are the impacts that the world has had on me and my peers. And I think that I think that getting out of purely for much of my life, for probably my entire twenties, uh, anarchism and the promotion of anarchism and the attempt to create a stateless society has been my my singular goal. Um, everything else I do is subsidiary. To subsidiary? I don't know the right word for this. I'm supposed to know words. An- ancillary, maybe. Oh, maybe, but I really don't know what ancillary means, which makes me really embarrassed because this book came out, Ancillary Justice, that everyone's really excited about. Um, Let's go with ancillary. That sounds right. Uh, Unrelated, I once ran A Country That Goes Through a Grade Level Analyzer, and it was written at about a fifth and a half grade level. Hell yeah. I was really excited about that. Yeah. Um, I don't think I would give it to a fifth grader um, because of some of the things that happen in it. But I don't know. What do I know about giving to a fifth grader? I probably would have read it when I was in fifth grade. So when I got involved in trying to write science fiction and I started caring about genre fiction and not just from the point of view of how it affects social change, but just literally like what are stories? How do I care about constructing stories? Um, it's actually a very specialized field. I want everyone to be able to do it in the same way that I like think punk is great because it says it doesn't matter if you suck, go play music. Mm-hmm. But I'm always going to appreciate people who spend eight hours a day practicing fiddle. Yeah. I think specialization also has a, a role and I've been attempting to specialize along with a lot of other people in writing stories. And so I enter this entirely different culture and now I have another thing I care about as much as I care about anarchy. And it's done wonders for my ability to interact with anarchy or to interact with sort of the culture that considers itself the anarchist culture. One of my favorite things about watching my friends get older is that we all seem to do this. Mm -hmm. We pick something, career or hobby or, I mean, I hate the word career and hobby, but whatever, some other interest and get just as excited about it and um, I think that that makes a more well-rounded revolutionary. Mm-hmm. And so just being exposed to different people who care about something as deeply as I do about storytelling but do not share my political assumptions has been incredibly useful. It's also helped me realize that anarchism is not as like crazy pants wingnut out there as I always sort of perceived it to be. Within writing subculture, anarchists and progressives get along great because within political culture, the progressives you run into have a specific liberal program that they are trying to enact. And they are, in essence, in many ways, are, are political foes. Um, they you know, want to expand the role of the state. They, there's a reason that everyone on both sides of the political spectrum uses liberal as a negative word, right? But when you move out of activists and into writers... I have found across the board that the people who are like, hell yeah, anarchist demon hunters with crazy deer that eat people are often the same people who have a Hillary sticker on their car or a Bernie sticker or whatever. 
and the the divide just isn't there. It's us versus the reactionaries in science fiction. Uh, science fiction is actually going through an upheaval right now, anyway, mm. where um, there's all these anthologies that are being put out with awesome names like um, "Queers Destroy Science Fiction." It's it's our team putting them out. Oh, okay. Uh, it's and it's reaction to the people who say. Um, you know, oh, these queers are ruining science fiction. And they were like, hell yeah, we are. Mm -hmm. Let's see what else we can ruin. And so it's like people of color destroy science fiction, people of color destroy horror, like all of these anthologies. Excellent. And it's um, and it's not just identity-based issues that are often being presented in these things. I think that so sort of radicals of all stripes are kind of, not all stripes, but, you know, good lefty-ish stripes are like sticking together more uh, within that culture. And also, like, being an anarchist doesn't make me a pariah at all. It, it, um, I remember uh, a friend and sort of mentor is a science fiction writer named Eileen Gunn. And we were at a convention, and she was just walking around introducing me to being like, oh, you have to meet Margaret. She's an anarchist. And, and I'm, like, being introduced to, like, some of the, like, you know, top-tier yeah. science fiction writers from when I was a kid. And so I, I got introduced to Joe Haldeman, who wrote The Forever War, and as this, as, you know, you must meet Margaret. She's an anarchist. And Joe Haldeman looks and says, oh, me too. That's awesome. Whereas, like, I, I imagine the flip side where you got to meet so-and-so, they're a fascist, would garner some very, very different responses, especially ugh, among, like, a lefty, lefty crowd. Right. Yeah, totally. It's not just a, like, we love everyone regardless of their political position. Yeah. It's like... It's just actually something. And I'm sure there's many other people who probably just don't speak to me when I go to these things mm. for that reason. But good. They also probably wouldn't speak to me because I have stubble and I'm wearing a dress. Mm. So whatever. Yeah, this like question of a cultural front is really, really interesting to me. Like I'm going to be thinking about that more. I could also see, you know, not thinking about anarchism like writing plus anarchism because it seems like a lot of your writing has been done as your job you know in capitalism and like I remember talking with you at various points about you know this thing that an editor is you know pushing back against or like this thing that an editor wants that you really really don't want especially like via you, you, you mentioned the, like, quote, horrible, romantic, trashy, heterosexual, whatever mm -hmm. that you are forced to write. So I could see that being, like, a dynamic that kind of undercuts a political sort of vector. But also, yeah, also we have now this novel and we have, you know, Country of Ghosts and Super Happy Anarcho Fun Pages, <laughs> which we haven't talked about at all, which, like... I know that you are like somewhat punk famous for writing those <laughs> as well. <laughs> are you going on book tour with this novella? Uh, I'm going on a very small book tour. Mm -hmm. uh, I originally was going to go on a much larger book tour, but I'm running into some um, housing complications mm -hmm. that one might call housing insecurities. And uh, we'll probably be moving back into my van for a little bit mm -hmm. and kind of need to get some stuff together around that. So I'm, I'm going to have to mostly stick around Asheville. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to, I'm going to, at the very least, I'm doing a book release here in Asheville at Firestorm on August 15th, 7 p.m. And I'm also going to do an event um, at uh, Red Emma's in Baltimore on the 17th, August 17th. Uh, I believe also at 7 p.m., but I'm not 100% certain about that. And I'm looking at trying to put together a few events in the area, like the Triangle area, Richmond or D.C. or something. It's interesting because I've gone on long book tours before. Um, I very much enjoy the feedback mm -hmm. that I get um, when I go on a book tour and people basically like tell me what I'm doing wrong, um, especially when they do it politely, of course. Uh, although, you know, sometimes I'm wrong enough that people say it impolitely and that's also appreciated. And so I'm kind of a little bit sad that I won't be going on a longer tour for this. Um, I might maybe with the when the sequel comes out. Nice. Well, that is super exciting. How can people find more work, more of your work? Uh, I have a, a blog. Um, if you forget the actual URL, it's margaretkiljoy.com, but then there's birdsbeforethestorm.net is my, is my website. And, you know, I say things on Twitter and Facebook, all the various social things. Sick. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to add for this interview? 
I think that the final straw radio is an important part of this cultural front. I I listen to y'all's show whenever I'm, well, you know, doing something like making buttons or doing some, you know, mindless work or driving or something. And it makes me feel like I am part of a culture and a community of resistance. And sometimes I'm driving around and I listen to like random talk radio of some political position I don't appreciate at all. And I'm like, man, I wish there was more anarchist talk radio. And uh, so I'm really excited to be on the show, but I'm really excited that to be, you know, comrades with you as we do this thing. Uh, I just teared up a little bit when you said that. Thank you so much. Uh, and Margaret Kiljoy, thank you so much for coming onto the final straw and helping me in my personal project of interjecting a little bit more art into the final straw. And also for talking about the book, which again, or yeah, the book, which will, which will drop on August 15th from tour.com. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. This is WSFM LP, Asheville FM, 103.3 FM in Asheville, North Carolina. And this has been The Final Straw. I'm William Goodenough. Thanks so much for listening to our interview with Margaret Kiljoy about her new novella, The Lamb Will Slaughter the Lion, out on August 15th from Tor.com. You can see her speak about this book on its release date at Firestorm at 7 p.m.